this is love. Sacrificial love. Not the love of this world which is all very conditional. If you jump through these hoops, I will love you. If you give me what I want, I will love you. If you set me on a pedestal, I will love you. If you get me a house, I will love you. If you give me a car, I will love you. If you give me a job, I will love you. Otherwise, I'm not going to love anything. Only myself. And yet when we understand the love of the Father, to give his only son to pay the price for us. That is amazing love. If we all start to work on that basis as believers and start to really apply what we're learning rather than just knowing it, to build a relationship with the God of the universe instead of just knowing about him, things change. And if we start obeying the law of God through our hearts rather than just rules and regulations and religious organizations, if we start to apply that love to our neighbors, if we love our neighbors as ourselves and loving God first, then things will change. So reading from Joshua chapter 23 and 24. What do you do to serve the Lord? How are you serving the Lord? What does it mean for you to serve the Lord? What is it to be one of God's people? How does that really apply in your life? This is what we have to understand about these these chapters, Joshua was very old, advanced in age, and we're talking about something which is wisdom, we're talking about something that has been born through experience, we're not talking about the internet and information overload that we've got, we're not just talking about knowledge, we're talking about experience, that they have experienced God, that they have had their faith tested, and this is something that's very important for a, a Christian today, is that we need our faith to be tested. You know, when everything's going wonderful, when everything in your life is, is moving along perfectly well, and you have enough money, you have enough food, you have a nice home, you have good relationships going on, and things are really working well in this world, then you know, having faith doesn't really do much for you in the sense that it's not tested faith. Faith needs to come up against problems. Faith needs to come up against enemies. Faith needs to recognize that this world is not your friend, that this world is actually a hostile place. And it doesn't mean that we all become miserable about living here on the earth. No, not, not at all. It's not about... Um, being resentful and bitten. It's, it's about understanding what this world offers you as opposed to what God offers you. It's understanding that we have a created uh, world. Our Creator created this world and created us in it. And it was for us to enjoy so long as we followed God, so long as we obeyed God, so long as we served God, then we don't get confused and start serving ourselves or serving <coughs> the world system. You know, This is what God is telling us here, really. And with wisdom, we understand because we experience God, because our faith gets tested in the trials and tribulations that come to us. When we really understand how much God loves us, when we really understand what this world is offering, uh, and what God says about it, and what God tells us about ourselves, and we become more understanding of ourselves, then we begin to gain wisdom. And, you know, Joshua was coming up to 110 years of age. And in chapter 24, verse 15, he says, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
that's a plaque that I have at home by the front door where we walk in and it says as for me and my house we will serve the Lord and it is something that is important to me it's very very important to me I believe that Joshua has taught me a great deal and you know he's saying that Joshua is 110 years of age when he's saying that and this is what we see in, in true faith, that when we really have faith, we want to serve the Lord. We don't just want to acknowledge that the Lord exists. And we're talking about Father God. When we see um, the Lord written in capital letters, um, the Lord means Yahweh. It means the God and his name was unmentionable. That's why they called him Lord because his name uh, was so important that they felt they couldn't even utter his name. This is the God of Israel. And so we have this real respect for God, this real awe of God. There's, there's in sense, a, there's a fear of God here. And in verse 14, Joshua now his final message to Israel, he gives them a charge. Verse 14, chapter 24, verse 14. It says, Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. So the first thing that we're we're being told by this very wise warrior and statesman, this leader of Israel, who's gone through all these battles and now has had the job of administering the inheritances and dividing up the land properly. This was a real leader under God. He really was a very godly person. He really was a man who wanted to serve God first and foremost. And the first thing he says, now therefore fear the Lord. So he's told them that, look, you didn't deserve anything of what you've got. You didn't work for this, it just came to you. And you think that you did it. But in actual fact, I did it. We're told that God determines where we work and where we live. And that, God holds everything together in his hands. The whole world revolves in God's hands. And so whatever you have, wherever you are, you may be going through a very good situation. Everything might seem really good in your life. You may have all the things that you need. You may not have suffered a tsunami or an earthquake or a fire like in California and, and lose everything and possibly even you know your loved ones and maybe even people have lost their lives we know that many people have died in that fire themselves so they've lost everything and lost their lives too and so we never know when we're going to be called home as it were and so we need to make sure that we're in the right place with God that's very important and when we start to look at our lives, even as they are now, we've got to start putting a, a measuring line across our lives and saying, well, you know, to what degree are we serving the Lord? To what degree are we putting God first in our lives? Because Joshua knew that that was the only way to live and, and to feel the protection of God. The first thing he had to do, as he says to them, is now therefore... Fear the Lord. You haven't worked for any of this. I've put you in this land. I've given you this land. I've given you this job. I've given you this house. Given you this car. Given you this relationship. Given you this family. Given you this community. Given you this way of life. Which, for all intents and purposes, is protected. You, you're at rest now. You're at peace. And there's many places around the world that are at war. But fortunately in this country we're at peace at the moment. But we never know what catastrophe is going to befall us. You never know what nature throws at you. 
This world is is dying. This world is actually going through, you know, death pains, if you like, and we're actually assisting it. It's like we, 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 it's a bit of earthly euthanasia, if you like. We're actually helping it along with all the plastic and all the problems and all the pollution that we're pushing out. We're not being very good stewards. And so, in what way are we serving the Lord as a human race? For the most part, we're not. And God chose a people of him for himself out of this whole human race. And out of that people that he chose for himself, they would often go astray and forget to serve the Lord their God, and he would keep a remnant for himself. There was always a remnant. You wonder how the Jews survived, but there was always a remnant, you see. And we shouldn't be anti-Semitic. We shouldn't be anti the Jews. Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, if it's good enough for God to forgive, it's good enough for me. Yes, they crucified Christ, but they, they did not know what they were doing. But God made a new covenant with mankind after that. And we realize that part of that covenant is still serving the Lord. We're not under the law anymore in the sense of rules and regulations to be kept. We are under the rule of love in our hearts now. And the first charge to Israel is to fear the Lord. And so this is something that we should take on board for us. It's not that we should be cowering down before any thought of God. We, we through this new covenant of grace that that Christ has ushered in, we can come boldly before the, the throne of God in a right position of serving the Lord. But if we are opposite to the Lord, we cannot possibly come boldly before God. In actual fact, we, we need to really fear what the Lord can do. That's the important thing here. Don't despise what God can do. Don't despise what calamities could be brought upon you if you are not giving God the priority, if you are not really fully appreciating who God is and to live your life differently. It's not enough just to acknowledge God, that there is a God, that one exists. We need to be serving the Lord. We need to be putting him first in our lives. We need to be recognizing that he is the God of the universe and we are his creatures. And fortunately through Christ, we've become more than just creatures, we've become more than just created beings, we've become part of his family. We have been adopted into his family. And he is a father God, he's a loving father. And so we need to be aware that we're, we're serving the Lord, we're serving the Father of heaven. We're serving the Father of the universe, the Lord, Yahweh. He is our Father God. Jesus is the Son. And we're supposed to be glorifying the Father in the representation of the Father, which is the Son. And He's given us the Holy Spirit now to be able to do that, to be able to walk in the Spirit, to be able to recognize and acknowledge the spiritual realms, to be able to get into the Spirit, because we now have this testimony within us, the Holy Spirit of God, who opens our eyes, who illuminates Christ, and shows us the glory of God, and shows us who God is, and shows us who we are. We are convicted of sin. We are convicted of things that we are doing wrong. But at the same time, we're also empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're also able to communicate with God through the Holy Spirit. Our prayers are interpreted to the throne of God, to the Father himself, through the Holy Spirit. He testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. When we trust and believe in God and decide we're going to follow him and serve him, and the Israelites here were saying, yes, we're going to serve the Lord. And Joshua said, yeah, okay. 
but you know, what you're doing is is not necessarily that you we've got a time of peace now you you think you're great you think you're wonderful because you've conquered the land you've overcome the people and you you're living off the fat of the land now you're eating grapes that you never planted and you're you know you get you've got it really good now <laughs> we will serve the lord yeah of course but he could see them already starting to get involved with the people the amorites the people that are actually inhabiting the land that were going after other gods and they were starting to look at the females in the land and thinking hmm she's nice but she was be serving a different god and to get involved with her would cause problems and, and would cause division in a family situation intermarrying with other faiths doesn't work for God it means we are unequally yoked it means there's a conflict in the family one of the most important things that Jesus tells us is not to be unequally yoked is to be staying in faith we're not talking about race we're not talking about you know being a respecter of persons or disrespecting certain colors or creeds but we are talking about serving the same God and we have to fear the Lord we don't just come to a point where we can say oh well I'm sure God won't it will look the other way if I get married to someone who's not a believer that's going to come back on you it's going to come back on you if you don't trust God for your future and marry someone of the same faith because at some point in the future there is going to be a parting of the ways it doesn't work how can two walk together unless they're in agreement we're told in Amos and this is what we're talking about is this not being of the same faith not having the same love for God not having the same desire to serve the God of the Bible and we're not talking about any faith that serves a God is okay we're talking about the God of the Bible we're talking about the God of the whole universe the one true God and Joshua knew that because that had been tested and so he feared the Lord himself and when things went wrong with Israel and Israel had sinned the first thing that Joshua did was to get down on his face before the Lord he feared the Lord he knew that catastrophe would have continued if the sin hadn't been dealt with in the camp so fearing the Lord we're told is the beginning of wisdom and this is really true understanding what God can do understanding what God wants of us understanding how God expects our loyalty understanding how God expects us to have faith in him for everything and therefore this fear is a healthy fear of the Lord and then he says something else he says serve him serve him in sincerity are you serving him in sincerity you see intention is everything really but we have to follow through and it's all very well deceiving ourselves and say oh yes of course I want to serve the Lord this is what the Israelites were doing yes I want to serve the Lord and some of them would have been very very committed to that but there were many of them that were probably taking these words very lightly that there was no real sincerity of heart the spirit was really not alive the spirit was still dead in sin the spirit was still in rebellion these were still sons of rebellion there is still an attitude of placating God to make sure that you know they appeased God for a moment but then running after the things of this world running after all the things that they shouldn't have been the accursed things and so we're told to serve him in sincerity don't play games with God 
This is what Joshua is saying to us. Don't play games with God. Don't mock God. This is important. Very important. To serve him sincerely. To have a sincerity of heart in all that we do and recognize that our lives need to be one of service. It's not one of please yourself. It's not one of my, I'm going to fulfill my own agenda. It's not one of I'm going to do all the things that I want to do and God is like a bolt on that I'm going to ask to rubber stamp everything that I do and everything will be okay because I acknowledge God. I recognize that there is a God. But don't ask me to serve him over and above my own agenda. Don't ask me to serve God and put myself last. Don't ask me to serve God even to the point of death. Don't ask me to serve God and forget my ambitions or my agenda that I have, that I want to achieve in this life. Don't ask me to serve God in that way. And he was putting that right in the face of Israel. And they were saying, yes, of course, Joshua, we're going to serve God. We will serve God. And he says, well, verse 19, but Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. So if you're carrying on the way you are, I'm giving you this charge. I'm 110 years of age now. It's time for truth. I'm going to speak to you now as your leader, as the person that's fought alongside you, possibly saved some of you. Maybe you've saved me at times. We've worked together. We've fought together. And now I'm speaking not only to you warriors, I'm speaking to your whole families, to your children and their children and all the people that are in this land that God brought you to, and I'm speaking to you now, (coughs) and I'm saying to you, if you carry on the way you're going, and starting to really feel that you have arrived, and it's all about you, then you need to take stock, because you cannot serve the Lord, for he's a holy God. (coughs) He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. In other words, you need to really serve him with sincerity of heart. You cannot just mock God. You cannot just say, I'm going to serve God. Because you're making a testimony to yourselves here. Your words are going to condemn you. You know, when things have gone wrong, we said, oh God, if you just sort this problem out, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. I know many people who have said that. Be careful. Be very careful. Because our words condemn us. And so this is what was happening here. Joshua is saying, yeah, come on. I know you guys. (laughs) I know you people. Look what's happened. All I was there with Moses when you were grumbling in the desert. When you were being fed by, with manna and quail. I was there. I was there when we were told to go in and take Canaan the first time. And you all said, oh no, we can't do that. It's not about you. It's about God. And what are you doing about God? What's happening with God? How are you treating God? Are you sincere? in your desire to follow God. Because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I have served the Lord. And will continue to serve the Lord till I drop dead. But you're having a laugh. Don't be foolish now. Don't be silly in your understanding of what you're doing. Don't be in denial of the things that are going on in your life. Don't be switching off or, or, or using the old idea of, you know, it's like a scales to balance. Well, I've done, I've done some good and I've done some bad and it just about balances out. I should be okay on the night. God says, do not sin. Do not forsake me. 
Do not chase other gods. Do not go off after other things. <coughs> Do not put other things before me. Do not put other treasure before me as your treasure. Before the things of heaven. Before the spiritual things. You are a soul who lives in a body and your spirit is either dead or alive. And therefore you will serve the Lord if your spirit is alive. If you have been renewed, if you have been born again, you will serve the Lord properly. Because it's in you. Because you've been changed inwardly. You've been inwardly transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit rather than just conforming to the outward. These Israelites were conforming to the outward following the laws and unless someone really does have true faith in God and that's what he said serve him in sincerity and then he also says and in truth serve him in sincerity and in truth and when we serve him in truth something changes because it comes from the inward parts. It comes from the heart, from the spirit. It, it aligns itself with our soul that has been created by the divine. And so therefore when we, when we serve him in sincerity and in truth, we're, spot, we're told to worship in spirit and truth. It's the same thing. Sincerity of heart, spirit, to really understand who God is and, and acknowledge him as such and then treat him as such. So we're to serve him and him only because he's a jealous God and he won't accept us serving other gods. So if we're going to get with other people, with other partners, we need someone who is of the same yoke, who is of the same faith, who has the same desire to want to serve the Lord, to serve the Father, to know the Father, to recognize the Father through the Son. And then he says something else which is very important. He says, And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Put away the other gods that your parents served if they weren't serving the Lord. In other words, anything that your parents were doing, anything that your fathers or grandfathers or uncles and aunties, anything that your family, anything that your tribe was following prior to an understanding of who God is and coming to faith in Christ, whatever you were serving in your family and you may have been serving the gods of this world in terms of keeping up with the Joneses or slandering people, your neighbours, in your mind, killing them in your mind, being critical of other people. This may be your family base, that you were worshipping money in your home. Your parents may have been worshipping money. It may have even been inverted snobbery. They may have been against anyone who had money because they were poor and they were always after money. It may be that there was a, a sense of failure and therefore there was jealousy if anyone had success. And so there was an attitude of criticism in that area. It may be that they were into property and inheritance like the Israelites wanted somewhere to live, which is fair enough. We all need someone to live. But maybe they were taken up with this. This was the be all and end all. You were only somebody if you owned a big property or several properties. You were only someone if you had things. You were only someone if you were attractive on the outside. They may have been worshipping their bodies. Your mother or father could have been a gym bunny or someone who was into 
bodybuilding. They may have been about being like Ken and Barbie, you know, Barbie dolls. And th th that might have been what your experience was, that everything was about the outward adornments and looking good. And God says, put away other gods. Joshua said to Israel, put away other gods, even from your father's house. And especially any gods that you were taught to, to serve. As you were brought up to serve gods, and it could be s gods of violence. It could be gods of paying back. It could be gods of resentment. It could be gods of bitterness. It could be gods of all types. You have to work through this and understand what it was that your parents were doing, even in the name of God. They could have been serving other gods, even in the name of God. Even the religious way that people served God Instead of serving God, they were serving the created things. Instead of serving God, they were serving statues or pictures. They may have been serving God in their eyes by being churchgoers, but their lives were no different. They may have been serving gods by being ritualistic and, and religious in their, in their life, but they had no love in their hearts. There's so many things that get in the way of our relationship with God and our relationship with God is all in all. That's why we serve the Lord. That's why we want to serve the Lord because we know that the Lord loves us. We know that God loves us and we love God back. And part of that loving God back is about serving God and doing what God calls us to do, of being obedient to the Lord. One of the first things that we need to teach children is to obey your parents, as in the Lord. To give them a healthy understanding of who God is, to be able to obey God. And we have to be very careful as parents that we're not teaching them to obey us in contradiction of God's laws and God's ways and what God shows us. We cannot say love God and don't love your neighbour. It, it's, it's wrong. We have to give our children the same kind of understanding that we can gain when God shows us how to be servants towards Him. Children who love their Father in Heaven. We have to teach our children to be the same, to be obedient to God. If we're doing everything and, and anything, then our children are going to do the same. So this is something we have to be very careful about. We have to teach our children to do what's right according to God. And we're not perfect. Sometimes we get things wrong. But when we realise that, we need to be honest and we need to say, I got that wrong. I'm not perfect. And we all need to serve God and we all need to come to that relationship with God in our own right. Each one of us needs our own personal relationship with God. In the same way that I am no longer serving the gods of my fathers, I'm serving the one true God, you as my children need to do the same. You need to find that one true God for yourself and understand this is the God of the Bible. This is the God that I am serving. So if I get it wrong and I go the wrong way, you have your Bible open in front of you and you say to me, well, you're not doing what it says here. I'm going to follow God. Well, fine. I have to accept that that is the way it has to be. But we have to, as believers, we have to bring our children up in the admonition and the discipline of the Lord. We have to show our children the love of God, not just the discipline, but love is correction, we know, but we have to show our children love too and show them that this God of, that we have all this faith in is right. 
And so this is what we're, we're being told. This is what Joshua is telling to his children. In effect, the, these tribes, he's fought for them. He's become their father, really. He's become their earthly leader, their earthly father. And so they see him as their patriarch. Moses has died, now Joshua is the leader. And he's talking to them as children, he's saying, look, I know you. Don't just be saying, I'll serve the Lord, because God's holy. You really need to get down to cases with God and really build a relationship with God and really serve the Lord. And really understand that if you go astray, it's going to be bad for you. So finally in that charge he says, Put away the gods in your father that your, which your fathers served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. So he says it again, serve the Lord. This is the important thing, serve the Lord. And in verse 31 it says, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua who had known all the works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. So they served the Lord while Joshua was alive. And they carried on serving the Lord. What a great legacy Joshua gave to the children of God. To teach them to serve God faithfully and that they continued to do that while he was alive. And even the elders who outlived him they kept with God until they had all died too. And so that was a great testimony. But there is something that we have to draw from this as well, and that is that my faith isn't your faith. And I can say, I will serve the Lord, and I may have influence over you, and I may be able to convince you that that's my God is working really well in my life. But unless you have your own faith with God, and unless you teach that to your children, at some point down the line, everything is going to go astray again. And so Joshua was hoping upon hope that his teaching would continue, that his, his commitment of his faith would, would be a great witness to people right down through the ages. And of course it was, it stood, it was in the book of the law, it says... Um, that he wrote these things in the book of the law. But once he died, that was it. His faith died with him. Once I die, my faith dies with me. Whatever faith my children have, or the people that I've taught from this pulpit, whether it be locally, or whether it be over the internet, whatever, my faith dies with me. You have to get your own faith. Everyone that I've touched and taught has to get their own faith. They have to build their own relationship with God. And there's only one way to get that, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is an enduring faith, a lasting faith. And faith needs to be tested. And so it's so important that we we give this to God, that we really understand who it is that we're serving, why we're serving God, the fact that He is the one true God, that the, He is the God of the Bible, and the Bible tells us very explicitly who this God is and who we are. It's just like a window to look through to see God, and it's also like a reflection that we can look in the Bible and read the Bible and see ourselves and to see our bankrupt state, our moral bankruptcy. You know, peacetime brings blessings and temptations. That's what happened here. You know, when we get some R&R, &R, when I was in the forces, you know, you got some R&R, &R, you got some rest and relaxation, you got some time out, you got a bit of holiday, you, you were taken away from frontline stuff. And of course, in that time, you get a bit complacent. I remember having some time out when I came back from Cyprus to the UK when I was in the RAF, and the first day I went back to camp, I was told, GET YOUR HAIR CUT! <laughs> <laughs> you 
you know, this is force is life. And it's the same <laughs> with God in that <coughs> when we get some rest and relaxation, when we, when we get the blessing and we get some peace and we can relax, we can easily fall back into what God has told us to stay away from, the world system and the temptations that come from the world. And that it comes through a complacency. We become sometimes a little bit immune to what God is saying and we we take on the diseases of the world so quickly and Joshua knew his people so the threat that Joshua saw now it was just as Moses prophesied because he was there when Moses prophesied all this and he knew that the people at some point he knew Moses and Moses didn't get it wrong and he knew that the people would be going astray at some point and that there would be danger but this danger now it was no longer military with Joshua, they had rest from the land, generally. They had conquered the land, generally. There were pieces to mop up, but with God on their side, that wouldn't be a problem. But this was no longer a military threat. This was no longer like a physical, physical might that was causing them to worry or, or problems in that sense. But now there would be a moral and spiritual issue. The fight would be moral. The fight would be spiritual. Last week we looked at chapter 22 and there was the threat of the eastern tribes backsliding, you remember. And then they all were relieved that the eastern tribes were still faithful and what they were setting up that altar for was just to remind future generations that, you know, they have to be part of the worship of God with the rest of Israel as a witness of what God had done. In the book of Judges, when you go past Joshua, we're at the end, the last chapter of, of Joshua, and we're into the book of Judges, and it starts to say similar things to what was in, gives a kind of overview of what happened with Joshua, but it begins to show us um, it spells out the backsliding and the moral spiritual decay that would eventually cause defeat and then on to eventual captivity of the Israelites because they had gone away from God. And we have to be careful. This is a warning to us today, not that we want to be you know, austere and, and serious and, and, and really want to have a miserable message, but it's a warning. We have to heed the warnings of God. And Joshua was warning his people, you know, he's a holy God. Don't mess with this holy God. You say you're going to serve the Lord, you serve the Lord. Because if you don't, and you're saying by your own mouth that you will serve the Lord, if you're making this covenant with God right here, right now, if you're making this agreement with God, God knows everything and God wants you to be obedient to him and serve him from the heart and so you have to be very careful and he didn't want to see all his friends be led off into captivity and and be killed and have problems so what are we facing today then it's the same kind of thing human problems the, those philosophers have said oh we're getting better we're improving but we're not there is an, incre an incredible decline in morals today and spirituality especially there's lots of religious dogma from all the different faiths including Christian dogma including people in the church there is so much spoken in Christianese and at the same time people's not People are not really honouring God. There's crime, there's drugs, there's alcoholism, there's divorce, there's terrorism, there's child abuse, there's spouse abuse, there's corruption, there's stress, there's mental health issues, 
there's per parental dysfunction, never, learn, never mind family dysfunctional problems, parental dysfunction, they don't know how to parent children anymore. We've lost it along the way. We now believe that loving a child is giving it everything it wants and letting it do anything it wants. What a screwed up world we live in. It doesn't work. There has to be boundaries. <coughs> Children have to be disciplined. There needs to be discipline. No wonder we have all these problems in the schools. No wonder we have people running around with guns and killing people in the schools. Other children, other adolescents killing people. It, we've got knife crime that's gone out of, out of orbit. It's become, <laughs> the papers say it's Wild West England or Wild West Britain, but certainly Wild West England, the amount of knife crime in London. I wonder why. We've got technology and information that's soaring. Artificial intelligence. We are becoming greater and better and we've become moral adolescents. That's what's happened. <laughs> There's little or no emotional intelligence on the planet. And yet we're supposed to be getting better. So we can know how our minds work, we can learn about the brain, and yet the more we know, the more information we have, it seems like the less wisdom that we seem to gain. Wisdom doesn't seem to be important anymore. Knowledge is important. Knowledge is power. This is what we have as a, as a world. And so we become defensive and cut off from our love. We have become hardened in heart because we want what we want and we want it now. This is the world we live in. And so what are we going to do about it? How do we get back in touch with love? How do we get back in touch and begin to gain emotional intelligence? How do we begin to s stem the tide? How do we begin to slow this moral corruption down? What have we got to do? Well, it's simple really. We need to get back to God. We need to read our Bibles. We need to just read our Bibles, not only to read them to understand them, but to actually apply them to our lives. This is what we need to do. And we apply them to our lives in the way of serving the Lord. This is it. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if we all start to work on that basis as believers and start to really apply what we're learning rather than just knowing it, to build a relationship with the God of the universe instead of just knowing about him, things change. And if we start obeying the law of God through our hearts rather than just rules and regulations and religious organizations, if we start to apply that love to our neighbors, if we love our neighbors as ourselves and loving God first, then things will change. And we can see that love in Jesus Christ. We can recognize it in Christ how much Christ loved us to give up his life for us and take on our sins upon himself. This is love. Sacrificial love. Not the love of this world which is all very conditional. If you jump through these hoops, I will love you. If you give me what I want, I will love you. If you set me on a pedestal, I will love you. If you get me a house, I will love you. If you give me a car, I will love you. If you give me a job, I will love you. Otherwise, I'm not going to love anything. Only myself. And yet when we understand the love of the Father, to give his only Son, to pay the price for us, that is amazing love. That is unconditional love because we didn't deserve it. That's the point. It's unconditional. This is mature love. This is selfish, uh, selfless love, rather. This is a giving kind of love. And this is the love we need to understand. And the world doesn't seem to understand that. If you ask people what does love mean, most people will say, I don't, I don't really know. But, you know, when we look at God, then we can see what love is. 
When we look at Jesus Christ, we can see how he showed us how to love. And even his disciples, when asked how people would know his death, because they would love one another. This is it. If we're going to be disciples of Christ, if we're going to have a relationship with the Father, then we need to be known by our love for one another and our love for others. Amen. Amen.